This is an introduction to Calculus 3, the third course in a calculus sequence. Sometimes it's called multivariable calculus because all of the problems are concerned with functions that have more than one variable. Most functions have one input and one output, but the functions we'll be talking about have either more than one input or more than one output. But before we talk about the different problems and examples you'll see in Calculus 3, let's do a brief recap of the problems you might remember from Calculus 1 and 2, also called differential and integral calculus of a single variable. All right, first, let's draw some xy axes. I'm going to draw a function, f, whose domain and range are both r, the set of real numbers. Typically, we write y is a function of x, y equals f of x. I'm just going to draw any old function. Looks like a cubic function. Fabulous. Now, what are some problems you might have done in Calculus 1? Well, given a point on your function, you might want to find the tangent line to that function. And you might remember that in order to find the tangent line, you need to find its slope and we figure that out by calculating the derivative of a function. In general, the quantity we're interested in, the derivative, measures the rate of change. The slope of the tangent line is its change in height, but there are other changes we might be interested in. Other problems you might remember from Calculus 1 include max-min problems or optimization problems. Given a function, can you find a point that's higher than any other nearby point? Sometimes, when you're doing an optimization problem, there will be some restriction on the set of values you're interested in. For instance, I could restrict this problem to a set of values on the x-axis, and I might want to find the maximum within that interval. So we'd call this a constrained optimization or a constrained maximization problem similar to the local max and min problem, both which you'll see frequently in applications. So far I've only talked about differential calculus or calculus 1. Calculus 2, in this case we're talking about integrals. In other words, given your function, you might want to find the area between two given x values that lies underneath the graph of a function and below or above the x-axis. In this case we're calculating an area or we're calculating the accumulation of some amount. And again you can calculate this using the powers of the integral, the antiderivative. The fundamental theorem of calculus tells us how those problems are related. Integrals are also useful for other types of problems for instance, we have a function which is not straight, a cubic curved function. We might want to find the length of a part of that function. In other words, calculate an arc length. And again, this is a problem which you can solve with integral calculus. Now there are analogies to all of these problems in Calculus 3. So in Calculus 3, remember, instead of y is a function of x, we have three-dimensional problems. In other words, three variables. z is a function of x and y. Analogies in three-dimensional space. So in this case, drawing an x, y, z axis is kind of difficult, but let's think of the x, y plane as lying flat on a table, extending out in front of us. And let's think of the z-axis as going up, perpendicular to the xy plane. I'm drawing the origin. Now I'm going to try to draw a three-dimensional function. These are always pretty difficult to draw. The function is going to be from r2, from pairs of real numbers, to r. In other words, the input is an x value and a y value. And the output of the function f is a z value. 
I'm going to draw a function. It's going to look kind of like a hill. So let me draw some curvy lines here. Give you the illusion of depth. There's lots of freely available function graphers out there which can draw much better three-dimensional pictures, but this will give you a rough idea of the type of problems we're interested in. So I've got myself a hill shape function. Maybe it's a little bit like a parabola, but the three-dimensional version, a paraboloid. Now what are some calculus-style problems? Well, we might be interested in, for instance, the rate of change in the x-direction, tangent line going in the x-direction, or the rate of change in the y-direction, or if you're traveling in all sorts of directions, imagine yourself standing on this hill and looking in each one of these directions. What's the slope? So once again, we're interested in tangent lines. Now, there's lots of things to take into consideration. Unlike the one-dimensional case, df dx. In this case, there's two types of tangent lines, tangent in the x-direction and the y-direction, or you can take some combination of x and y movement, and you can come up with the derivative in an arbitrary direction. And this, which you'll see a lot of, is called the directional derivative. In other words, if you have some kind of arrow pointing in a direction, you want to measure the slope in that direction, v, and calculate the directional derivative. The derivatives in the x and y directions have special names too. They're called partial derivatives. It turns out you can calculate the directional derivative in terms of the partial derivative. See a lot of that later. In addition to tangent lines, you might also want to calculate a tangent plane. That is, a flat surface that touches the graph in exactly one point. It's an analogy of the tangent line problem for three-dimensional functions. You can calculate both tangent lines and tangent planes. Now another problem from Calculus 1 was the maximization or optimization problem, and you can consider the same problems in Calculus 3. For instance, this function, this hill, has a local maximum right at the top of the hill. Again, you can use calculus to figure that out. But also, you might imagine yourself walking around this hill. If we get a purple line going around the hill, and the dotted region represents when I'm actually behind our field of view. You might say, as you walk along that path, at which point are you highest on the hill? This is another example of a constrained maximization problem limiting yourself to a curve on the surface, can you find the maximum? Now, in addition to these differential style problems, there are integral style problems in Calculus 3 as well. For instance, you might consider some line segment lying in the xy plane. If you plug in all those values of x and y along that segment, that gives you a curve on the surface. And if you connect the points in the xy plane to the points on the surface, it's almost like you've got a sheet of paper and you can calculate its area. And instead of being flat like it would be in Calculus 2, it's a little bit curved. If we call the curve down there in the xy plane, if we call that C, this is the symbol for calculating this type of integral. We might also consider the following problem. Let's say you have some kind of a rectangle in the xy plane. If you plug every point in that rectangle into our function f, you'll get a shape, a region on the surface, and it'll look kind of like a cube or a rectangular prism and you might be interested in calculating the area or the volume of that rectangular prism. And it's kind of hard to visualize, but it's almost like a box. It's flat on the bottom, but the top of the box is defined by that surface. And this kind of problem is twice as much fun as a regular integral. It's called a double integral.
The other problem, which we just saw, is called a line integral problem. And you can calculate both areas and volumes in three-dimensional calculus. Now some of the other problems you might remember from Calculus 2, you can use integrals to calculate the length of an arc. In addition, there's a three-dimensional analogy. The top of this rectangular prism, which I've shaded or hashed in orange, you can calculate the area of that surface. It sits above the rectangle, but it might be warped and curved in some way, and you want to calculate the area of a non-flat surface, just like the length of a curved line. Again, you can use multivariable integral calculus to solve that. In addition to analyzing these types of functions, a function from R2 to R, there's other types of functions out there. Calculus 3, we look at them all. For example, what if you have a function that has one real number as input, but two real numbers of outputs? So you might think of this as a vector function. In other words, it's giving you points in the plane as outputs. We often signify that with a vector notation. Think of t as the input, and the outputs are points x and y. Each component, each x and y of this function, depends on t. So as you plug in values of t, think of t like time, you have a point which moves along in the plane. For instance, when you plug in t equals 0, you might get this point here. And then as you increase t, you get a whole bunch of different points. This isn't really a function. It fails the vertical line test. x, y is not a function of x. However, x and y are both functions of t. And as t increases, you get more and more points along this curve, labeling a couple of points here get all sorts of interesting shapes, and you can ask your standard calculus questions about these. For instance, what's the rate of change or the slope at a given point? What's the area bounded by some region? In addition, you might have your outputs be a point with three coordinates. The first one, which we looked at, plane curves, is when you have one input value and two output values. It traces out a curve in the plane. If your function is from R to R3, if there are three output values, then we call that a space curve. Now in addition to these types of functions, you might have a function. I'm going to use actually a capital F for this, where the number of inputs is equal to the number of outputs. So for instance, a function which has two numbers as inputs and two numbers as outputs. Or a function which has three numbers as inputs and three numbers as outputs. These are interesting functions. With so many variables, how would you graph them? How would you interpret them? First, let me write out the function. I should use a capital F here. Think of the inputs as being points x, y in a plane. And I can write this as a combination of functions. The first coordinate is represented by the function little f1. And the second coordinate is represented by little f2. Now here's how we'll graph these functions. At any point in the plane, I'm getting two output values. And I'll use those two output values as a direction, a heading. At each point, the output of this function tells me a rise and a run, tells me how far to the left or right to move, and how far up and down, vertical or horizontal. And this type of graph is called a vector field. It can represent forces in physics, the movement of air particles, movement of water droplets in a river. You take one point and you move in the direction of the arrows in the vector field. And this is a very useful way of thinking about this function. We can analyze it using calculus as well.